There was a time when the day the circus came to town was the biggest day of the year. Farmers in the Midwest, factory workers in New England, children in crowded cities, everyone counted on the traveling circus to amuse and entertain them. When the circus came to town, businesses and schools would shut down so that people could follow the free parade down Main Street. In this parade came the most exotic and extravagant attractions any American could ever hope to see in his own hometown. Bizarre beasts from distant continents. Charcoal-burning, steam-powered calliopes. Forty horses hitched in a single team, pulling a $20,000 bandwagon. And perhaps most exotic of all, the men and women who worked and performed with the circus and who lived the circus life. They walked on wire. They danced on horseback. They flew through the air. They acted like they enjoyed risking their lives. They were nine feet tall. They had two heads, or hair all over their bodies. They always knew the latest jokes and the latest songs. They spoke their own language and lived by their own rules in their own world. The audiences of America couldn't get enough of the circus. Red Hot, here's where you get your Red Hot rope, Miss Tina. Go double jointed and hump back. By the end of the 19th century, the circus would become a major industry. But in the early days, all it took was a caravan of wagons to bring a self contained reality into town. A small, mysterious world for just 50 cents. Americans had mixed feelings about traveling show people. They admired them. They were jealous of them. They were afraid of them. They fell in love with them. The greatest fans were probably the children. They were most likely to believe the brightly colored posters or to have crushes on the scantily clad acrobats. Kids scared their parents by trying to imitate dangerous stunts and by threatening to join the circus when it left town. Parents, too, would admire the skill of a famous bareback rider, but they could also question the moral character of these all too worldly performers. men and women of the circus celebrated their bodies and pushed them to new limits. Performers put themselves on display in the circus in ways that weren't allowed anywhere else. In the process, they helped redefine Victorian ideas of masculine and feminine behavior. And by performing for audiences across the country, they brought their cosmopolitan attitudes to the hinterlands of America. The reputation of the circus for corruption was not entirely a matter of old-fashioned morality. Insiders said that a large percentage of circus profits in the smaller traveling shows before 1900 came from various forms of grift, 
cheating the customers. It started weeks before the circus ever got to town, when the advance men plastered every available surface with lithographs hyping the coming show. Although everyone knew that no circus could ever quite match its advertising, the anticipation and excitement were formidable by the time the circus hit town. The circus troupe would descend quickly with an air of disdain for the local natives who often seemed so out of touch with the outside world. The men who sold tickets to the anxious crowds often received no salary. In some circuses, the ticket takers even paid for the privilege. Their compensation was the money they shortchanged from the throngs. Shills were hired to get in line and push just to increase the excitement. And dips or pickpockets were permitted to operate on the midway in return for a percentage of what could be stolen. The crowd would pass the sideshow and move through the menagerie tents on their way to the big top. It was around the sideshow tent that the con artists hung out. And they offered such attractions as alcohol and gambling to gullible local men. Circus people used the word rube to describe local natives who were easily swindled. Fights between the show people and the rubes were an almost daily occurrence. Circus men knew to expect violence in some towns, like Scranton, Pennsylvania, where the coal miners had a reputation for short tempers. When they felt ripped off, they'd attack with rocks and lumps of coal. Or New Haven, Connecticut, where the young men of Yale always tried some college prank. When they tried to steal a trained monkey, the circus troupe used an elephant to fight back. Brawls between circuses and rubes could last for hours, and on several notorious occasions left over 20 dead. Rarely did circus troopers let such dangers slow them down. Most of them were born into the circus, with sawdust in their veins, they said. Trained in the skills of their parents, they knew no other life. They took pride in always making it to the next town and always putting on a show that would keep the rubes coming back year after year. Then there were those with a different vision of what the American circus could be, something more than a shady little show that gets in fights with the locals. Of these ambitious showmen, Phineas Taylor Barnum was the most visionary and the most successful. Crucial to his success with the circus was 30 years' experience running the world's most popular private museum. Everyone who went to Manhattan in the mid-1800s went to Barnum's American Museum. 
the most brilliant scientists and the simplest country bumpkins, European royalty and recent immigrants who could barely afford the 25 cent admission. They came to see stuffed animals, technological marvels, and supposedly ancient relics, as well as living curiosities, lions, white whales, camel leopards, leopard boys, albino families, and Siamese twins. Barnum himself was something of a living curiosity. He had cultivated a name for himself as the Prince of Humbugs. A humbug is a hoax, and Barnum was the master who mingled the scandalous, the ludicrous, and the sensational with enough education and morality to make the whole thing seem acceptable to all. Barnum's humbugs were perfectly suited to their audience. America's rapidly growing cities were starved for diversion. And at Barnum's Museum, people found a uniquely democratic entertainment. No one trusted the experts. Each individual decided for himself whether or not he was being bamboozled. His exhibition of the Fiji mermaid was typical. Barnum first drummed up interest by writing letters about the mermaid under false names and sending the letters to New York newspapers. Then he created advertisements based on what people might hope a mermaid would look like. What the public actually saw, after they paid their 25 cents, was the stuffed torso of a monkey skillfully sewn to the tail of a fish. Even if people suspected there would be no real mermaid, they came in droves just to see what Phineas Taylor Barnum was up to. Barnum had the ability to repeat his success almost endlessly. On several occasions, fires reduced his museum with all of its attractions and all of his animals to nothing. But after each catastrophe, Barnum rose again on the strength of his wits and his reputation. During one of these comebacks, he decided not to rebuild his museum. Already 60 years old, Barnum began a new career in the circus. The circus had been around for a long time before Barnum decided to take it over. Men like Purdy Brown, Gilbert Spaulding, James Raymond, and Nathan Howes had already begun the process of turning European circus traditions into a profitable American business. Barnum went into business with a circus man named William Cameron Coop. Together, they combined Barnum's museum and menagerie with a traditional circus and took them on the road. It was billed as a great traveling exposition and world's fair consisting of caravan, gallery of statuary and fine arts, polytechnic institute, zoological garden, and 100,000 curiosities. The actual word circus was played down to avoid any impression of vulgarity. Of his new show, Barnum said, for many years, it has been my pleasure to provide a class of instructive and amusing entertainments to which a refined Christian mother can take her children with satisfaction.
Barnum advertised something for everyone. Music. Theater. Science. Fine art. Clowns. Trained animals. The world's greatest acrobats. Barnum combined it all into one show that would dwarf and destroy his competition. In the world of the circus, old means of transportation were holding competitors back. Horse-drawn wagons on country roads could only travel 15 to 20 miles at a time, forcing even the biggest circuses to stop and play many small, unprofitable towns. Some say it was Coop, and others say it was Barnum, who decided to bring the circus up to date to move the entire operation by rail. It had never been tried on such a huge scale. The logistics were incredible. Three separate trains, 61 cars, three acres of canvas, almost a thousand people and hundreds of animals, all needed to be loaded, moved to the next town and unloaded every 24 hours with time left over for a parade and three performances. It fell on Coop as manager of the show to make it work. Many of the techniques developed by Coop remained in use for as long as circuses traveled by rail. A system of ramps and bridges between the railroad flat cars made it possible to load and unload the train from the ends rather than having to hoist wagons over the side. One hundred and thirty men loaded the circus trains. They were called Razorbacks, and they had highly specialized tasks, driving the horses, guiding the poles, chalking the front or the rear wheels, snubbing the brake rope. They had to work carefully to the rhythm of the train master's whistle. Moving the circus by rail was even more dangerous than performing under the tent. Despite the obstacles and the dangers, Barnum and Coop grossed over a million dollars in six months. Within a few years, Coop's railroad techniques were being adopted by other shows. The word railroad in circus advertising came to mean big, clean, and modern. Some of those who thought of circuses as dirty bohemian operations began revising their opinions. Yesterday, by the power of his presence and the magic of his golden advertising wand, Barnum transformed the hard time dullness of our streets into the gayest of holiday airs. He peopled the waste places with a multitude of expectant faces, 
He delighted and instructed thousands and finally sent everybody to bed, established in the conviction that he was the biggest hearted and best showman in the world and a representative American. Akron Daily Argus, 1875. Barnum's Railroad Circus found itself turning back customers from overcrowded tents. At the time, all circuses were one-ring circuses. All acts were trained in a standard-sized ring only 42 feet in diameter. To squeeze more people into the tent without enlarging the ring and retraining all the animals, Coop and Barnum added a second ring, two parallel circuses. Zazel, the human cannonball, was one of the first of the many daredevils who became popular with Barnum's show. Her basic technique of launching herself with an India rubber spring and using smoke and a loud bang to complete the illusion has been copied ever since. Big railroad circuses tried always to be modern. New inventions and fashionable crazes were turned quickly into startling sensations. Daredevils died in these modern contraptions. Professor Donaldson took off in his balloon one day and was never seen again. Diavolo died trying to execute his famous loop the loop on a bicycle once too often. But sometimes the acts weren't as dangerous as they looked. When Barnum advertised Salamander, the fire horse, jumping through blazing hoops, the ASPCA threatened to close the circus down. Barnum exploited the controversy as only he could. The 70-year-old empresario made a rare appearance at the circus, and in front of an audience packed with police and reporters, stepped through the fire himself. The chemical flames were frightening but harmless, and the ASPCA backed down. There was an educational component to these exhibits. After looking at pictures of animals drawn by artists who had never seen them, children got to see the real animals in circus menagerie tents, precursors to the modern zoo. displayed alongside the animals of distant lands, were humans. The U.S. was establishing itself as a world power, and the idea that foreigners could be imported as entertainment was always appealing. If actual foreigners were too difficult to hire, or turned out to be not quite exotic enough for the circus, it was relatively easy to find Americans who could pass. Wayno and Pluteno, 
the wild men of Borneo were advertised as brutal savages with superhuman strength. Actually, they were Barney and Hiram Davis, mentally and physically underdeveloped brothers from Ohio. William Henry Johnson, born in Liberty Corners, New Jersey, was presented as a curious missing link from West Africa. Johnson was born with microcephaly, which caused the condition known in the 1800s as a pinhead. He was almost certainly retarded, but under the stage name of Zip the What Is It, Johnson maintained a 66-year career. For a while, anything foreign was a big draw at the circus. P.T. Barnum started each performance with a grand pageant called the Congress of Nations. It consisted of actors impersonating the monarchs of the world and all of their entourages with exotic animals, gilded carriages, and uniformed musicians. Barnum began adding dramatic plots to his spectacles of international pageantry. Some of these theatrical productions could last half an hour, with casts of nearly a thousand people. Soon Barnum's biggest competitors were also putting on spectacles, specs, as they were known to people in the business. Practically everyone on the lot got into the act. Men from the rail and tent crews would join animal trainers, actors and dancers parading around the tent. Then they'd rush out of costume after the spectacle was over to start prepping for the move to the next city. Only the biggest circuses could put together a great speck. Perhaps the biggest of all was Adam Fourpaw Sr., whose shows were actually larger than Barnum's at times. This Philadelphia butcher-turned-showman gave Barnum a run for his money with spectacles like The American Revolution and La La Rook, featuring a woman billed as the most beautiful in the world. even Sitting Bull, who had just defeated Custer at the Battle of the Little Big Horn. Traditional circus acts and demonstrations of military drills from around the world also became part of the Wild West formula.
The Wild West shows traveled by train just like circuses and competed with them head to head. You have heard of circus fights, have you not? wrote Buffalo Bill to his brother. Well, they are lively affairs. The fighting is done with ink and paper and billboards and brainy men to write. Barnum called his circus the greatest show on earth, but there were a dozen others also big enough to advertise themselves as the greatest, the finest, the biggest, or the best. Each of the big shows kept several carloads of bill posters, called advertising brigades, running in advance of the performance. In a single season, one of the big circuses could paste well over a million sheets of paper to buildings and store windows across the country. If two circuses booked performances in towns and dates that were too close together, special opposition brigades were dispatched to outdo or even cover up the enemy posters. There were circuses that would even stoop to putting their own names with another circus's pictures. The art of negative advertising achieved its apex in the golden age of the circus. Competitors used small posters known as rat sheets to call one another names. In the strongest possible language, they accused each other of trying to cheat the public. P.T. Barnum and Adam Forepaw were both masters in the art of controversy as an advertising tool. They competed in everything. Forepaw won some battles, like the battle for Ben Lusby, the world's fastest ticket seller. Forepaw hired him away from Barnum's show and billed him as a marvelous attraction. Customers crowded around Lusby's ticket wagon just to hand over their money and see him count change with lightning speed. His record was 6,153 tickets in an hour. But Barnum won most of the bigger competitions, like the one for the world's biggest elephant. Barnum made Jumbo one of the greatest attractions in the history of the circus. Jumbo was more than just a financial success. He was a cultural phenomenon. His image was used to advertise everything from thread to laxatives. His name added a new word to the English language. Forpont retaliated with Bolivar, whom he called the world's heaviest elephant. But the public never responded. Even after Jumbo's death in a rail yard accident, he still outdrew Bolivar. Barnum fictionalized Jumbo's accidental death as that of a hero who died trying to save the life of a tiny clown elephant.
For years, Barnum displayed Jumbo's stuffed hide next to Jumbo's mounted skeleton in the museum tent. All of Barnum's elephants were trained to hold giant black handkerchiefs in their trunks and mournfully wipe their eyes. Another great rivalry broke out between P.T. Barnum and James A. Bailey. This rivalry would lead to the biggest circus yet. Bailey was the 35-year-old manager of the Great London Circus. A baby elephant had just been born at his winter quarters, the first elephant ever born in captivity. With the baby elephant as a major attraction, Bailey scheduled his show in the same towns on exactly the same days as Barnum, a cutthroat practice that was financially threatening to both circuses. Since Barnum couldn't beat the baby elephant, he offered to buy it. Bailey rejected Barnum's price. Not only that, he printed Barnum's offer in an ad saying, here's how much Barnum likes our baby elephant. Barnum was beaten at his own game, but he liked Bailey's style. Since Barnum and Coop had parted company, Barnum and Bailey and Bailey's partner Hutchinson joined forces in 1881, creating what would become known as Barnum and Bailey's greatest show on earth. Many circuses may have claimed to be the greatest, but this grand consolidation probably deserved the title. It was James Bailey who turned the modern circus into an organizational marvel. One journalist wrote that no army knows such severe discipline. Every 24 hours they solve a military problem that would have staggered Napoleon himself. quartermaster of the Imperial German Army followed Bailey for weeks, trying to learn how he kept the whole operation running so smoothly. Although P.T. Barnum rarely went to his own circus, James Bailey was an orphan who had lived with the performers and workmen since he was a child. Bailey's circus was like a company town, population a little under 1,000. Like any company town, the basics of life, at least, were provided for by the employer. This traveling town had its own class system, partly imposed by the company, partly the result of long-standing tradition. Bareback riders and acrobats who had earned a spot in the center ring were the aristocrats of the circus. They got Pullman berths on the trains, two buckets of water, a trunk, and the best seats at dinner. Managers were also highly valued. 
clowns a little less so. Freak show performers kept to themselves. They were paid according to their ability to draw a crowd, except the fat lady whom Bailey paid by the pound. At the bottom of the hierarchy were the workmen. They slept two or three to a bunk and were not allowed to fraternize with performers. Barnum and Bailey established a code of conduct for all their employees. No sleeping together, no drinking, no shortchanging the customers, and no pickpockets. Other circuses called it a Sunday school show. Barnum and Bailey had turned family values into a legitimate industry. No rube could leave this show feeling cheated. It was too clean cut, too much fun, and simply too big. Just before he died at age 81, Barnum used the latest invention, Thomas Edison's phonograph, to record his voice for posterity. So that my voice, like my great soul, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great, and as I believe, happy majority. Although Barnum died in 1891, his greatest show on earth still carries on. James Bailey ran it until his own death in 1906. Then the five Ringling Brothers from Baraboo, Wisconsin took it over. At that time, the circus was still the most popular amusement in America. In addition to Ringling and Barnum, there were almost 100 circuses traveling the country the most ever. Barnum had combined all known forms of 19th century mass entertainment into a remarkably durable new form. But with the invention of Edison's phonograph and the motion picture, the big circus stopped being the most modern of all entertainments.
and with the invention of the automobile, traditional horse-drawn wagons and even railroads became outdated and were left behind. To Americans who could drive themselves to the public zoo, or fly to another country, or see action and spectacle in the movies, the circus seemed less exotic, not dangerous or controversial anymore. If anything, an old-fashioned pastime for children. The 19th century rube had begun to disappear. With him went the golden age of the circus. <laughs> 